And uh, Dr. Kaufman, we're starting with you. We have your PowerPoint is up on the screen. And when you remember, uh, just say next and I'll advance the slides, okay? And you're okay. All right, your time starts now. Okay, we're off. Uh, for those of you who have seen me speak before or bought my books or whatever, understand that I, I start my discussions with the fact that there are two warring worldviews here in the United States, and one of them is about to take over for a very, very bad result. Uh, most of you probably recognize that our founding fathers used the writings of John Locke to establish the Constitution, the right to Declaration of Independence, and so forth, on an unalienable right that's based on a whole a series of things of God-given rights that basically drive our Constitution. If you next, let's go next. If you look at the diagram of this, what you will see is basically it is based on God-given unalienable rights. Then it comes to individual, city government, county government, state government, federal government. The federal government having the least power of all, only 18 enumerated powers. I'm not going to spend much time on this because I think you probably probably recognize it. And the Constitution is designed not to restrict uh, people, but to restrict government. That was the whole purpose of the Constitution, which is actually being turned on its head right now. The concept of property rights is extremely important. Our founding fathers understood that. It's becoming aware now in the world today that how important these private property rights are. And this new worldview that's coming in denies private property rights. If it denies private property rights, there is no basis upon which to create wealth and prosperity. As you see here in this index of legal property protection, uh, basically the more property protection you have, the richer the nation on a per capita basis. The other opposing philosophy or warring philosophy that is now entrenched in our government, is entrenched in our educational system, is entrenched basically in uh, our judicial system, is that of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a French noble one, who wrote uh, the social contract back in the 1800s. He basically is responsible or known for the uh, French Revolution, the modern European socialism, and even communism. Marx really used Rousseau quite a bit in trying to develop his, uh, his um, manifesto. That is just the reverse. That form of government is the reverse of what I just showed you. Basically, you have a federal government that's all powerful, it's sovereign over the state, it's sovereign over the local government, and it's sovereign over families and individuals, you and I. And what you're seeing President Obama doing right now is trying to establish that sovereignty with the lawsuit against Arizona, with a whole host of things that he's doing and suing the states and individuals. He is trying to establish the fact that the federal government is, a is sovereign over all things below it. Now, I just come out with a new book. This is, just came out this week, uh, basically called Plunder. Why don't you go and do next again? I'm sorry, I haven't been saying next. I hope you've been going next as you've been going along here. Oh, you should be seeing a, a book of my book, a uh, picture of my book, Plunder, on the screen. We have it. And underneath that, I would like to give each and every one of you a free copy of this book. If you like me by going to epinc at roadrunner.com and being able to get the book, and we'll send it to you free of charge. The purpose of that is that we need to have people understand what's at stake in this election. It's a huge, huge election, as you well know. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And this book will really help you put together the understanding of what is really going on in this country from a philosophical as well as a fundamental standpoint. The progressive ideology is primarily talking about progressive ideology and how it's destroying America. We have two things, Michael's very familiar with these. You have Republicans within the Republican Party, neocons and rhinos, they control the Republican Party. The Democrats to the far left, those are the progressive liberals, they control the Democratic Party. Both of them, if you go next now, down to our, the Republicans, the neocons, basically have a fascist type of mentality. They believe in this concept of work, the government working closely with industry. The Democratic far left or those progressives are more interested in socialism and Marxism. And you're really seeing that with this administration. Centralized government 
Both of them want a centralized government. Now the neocons of the rhinos, or what we call night rhinos, they sniff nicks. I keep saying, forgetting to say nicks. What we're seeing here is the fact that they all want centralized government. That's why when the Republican Party is in control, nothing ever changes. There's still more and more being brought to the central government. Eventually, they want to create a world government. So understand that that's the ultimate end game is to create a world government. And then next, world, the, the uh, Republicans want the uh, world policemen. They generally jump into war very easily. Uh, they're very militaristic and so forth. Whereas the Democrats are really striving for massive social programs. They want, they believe that they can control all the problems in the world if they just had a program big enough. And that goes with taxes as well. The Republican neocons basically want public-private partnerships where the government works very closely in a fascist relationship with industry. And of course, you're fully aware of the Texas Trans Trans Texas Corridor. That's a classic example of the public-private partnership where the state of Texas entered into an agreement with Centra, a Spanish firm, to build the Texas uh, Corridor that was going to go into Oklahoma, except you guys stopped it. On the other hand, you have the government on the, on the Democratic far left, you have the government control of everything. They really honestly believe that if the government was controlling everything, of course at the head, all of our problems would be solved. And we'll see what the Republican or neocons are controlled capitalism. When I say capitalism, I don't mean the classic capitalism are basically free market enterprise. What I'm talking about is a controlled system where you have uh, thousands of laws and so forth that basically keep out new entries into whatever area that you want to have and basically becomes a cushy job, a cushy issue, situation for the existing companies and so forth that are in control. On the Democratic far left, you have extremely heavy taxation. No tax is, is a bad tax. And they want, and they really do want this in the sense that they believe that if they have enough money, they can solve all problems. And then finally, some examples, Nixon was a neocon, but both President Bush's, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, Lucas Nolte, Maine, Romney, I'm not sure, but I suspect Romney, as there's every indication that he is, we'll see a little bit more as things go along. Obama is definitely a classic. Uh, liberal, progressive. Pelosi, I think Pelosi's actually gone over the edge. I don't. I think she basically is is um, certifiable. Reed, Maxine Waters is basically a communist. She says so, and so is or not not so is. But Chuck Sumer is another example of the far left progressives. The actual uh, congressional progressive caucus. If you actually get into some of their internal work documents, what you will find is that they are definitely Marxist. Now, it comes from this philosophy, uh, from the social contract. I'm not going to go into it. I normally do, but I don't have time this morning. What I want to do is really focus on a couple of key points. He really hates Christianity. He hates Christianity. And what we're seeing today, of course, is the same thing happening with the current administration and the progressive movement, the progressive media, and so forth, despise Christianity. The whole issue with the Second First Amendment rights of the Catholic Church and so forth is a classic example of how this is being formulated in political themes. And then finally, this is what's disturbing, is that Rousseau wrote this in the social contract, and I'm going to go down to the second paragraph. If he does not believe, in other words, if you don't believe the civil religious tenets of the faith, in other words, he created his own religion, let him be punished by death. He has committed the worst of all crimes. And we're really seeing that. We saw that in spades in the French Revolution going next. Uh, are you keeping up with me? I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to say next. Yes, we are. Should be seeing a picture of the French Revolution now. That particular revolution is one of the most bloody in the, in the recent history of modern warfare. It is basically uh, unbelievable what they were doing. They were actually ripping li limbs off of 
living people, pulling them apart at the seams because of their belief that we have to have this form of government or they're going to be have no government. This is during the French Revolution. It was horrible. And what we have seen since that time with all of the advancements of Marxism around the world with communism is that there are hundreds of millions of citizens that have been murdered by their government on this principle. It is really a devastating concept of government. It really is. It always leads to some sort of disruption. We're seeing that today. What really got me, uh, and really led me to read the book, to write the book Plundered, was this book, The Crowd. It was written in 1895. We're on a new slide now, by the way. And that particular book was written by Gustav Le Bon, a, basically a psychiatrist, one of the earliest psychiatrists in that field of study, where he studied what was happening during the late 1800s. And what he saw was shocking. Where he, I just want to abbreviate this, where he said, the sentiments and ideas of the persons involved take one and the same direction, and their conscious personality vanishes, a collective mind is formed, but presenting very clearly defined characteristics. Well, we're, that's exactly what we're seeing today. The same goes on to say that it's no longer this person's or himself, but has become an automaton who has ceased to be guided by his will. And what we're seeing in the liberal Democrats today, or liberal um, progressives today, is this idea that they act like automatons, they just respond the same way. The example that we just have seen here recently about the, the vote putting down yesterday of the, um, in the U.S. Senate of the law against um, sex uh, abortion is a classic example. They do not want to impinge anything to free, oh, there is freedom to abort unborn fetuses, and as a consequence, even though this action <coughs> is really outlined by all other nations, they refuse to do it. They must all, most often have only a very distinct relation with the observed fact, and this is the critical thing that makes them so di dangerous, is that they cannot connect to reality. They literally cannot connect to reality. And then finally, going on to the next one, the sense of invincible power, the concept that they are all powerful than they have been over the last 50 years. They've had enough money, basically, over the last 50 years to do whatever they want and force it on the American people. They have this contagion of thought. If you look at a school of fish, and all of a sudden they're heading in one direction, they just automatically turn and go a totally different direction as a unit. You see that all the time in the political movement. Something comes up, and by the next day, everybody is saying, every one of these people are saying exactly the same thing. The individual sacrifices his personal interest to the collective interest. In other words, they lose their individual identity, which is not unusual for them because they have a collective thought. But they basically really do lose their own identity in this process. They commit acts of utter contradiction with their characters and character and habits. We basically saw this in the storming of the State House in Wisconsin last year uh, with the unions. Uh, it was just unbelievable what was going on there. And then finally, the mere fact that he forms a part of an organized crowd or a mob, a man that's in several runs in the ladder of civilization, isolated, he may be cultivated individual in a crowd, he is a barbarian. And we're seeing that in space, especially with the Occupy Wall Street movement, that is going to be resurging, I believe, over the summer. And then finally, without the restraining presence of representative authority, in other words, the rule of law, the contradictor, the one that disagrees with the mob, indeed would be done to death. Now that hasn't really happened here in this country. It is beginning to happen in Europe right now, and basically they're under the same type of government that we're talking about right now. And throughout history, this has been the case. It leads to so much violence and hatred, utter hatred, that death is usually happening when you have one of these violent things. Uh, in Europe, we're seeing violence uh, on a scale that's never been seen before. And even in the United States with Occupy Wall Street, uh, where we're looking at pictures of, of uh, violence activities in Wall Street, or in Wall Street and other cities around the country. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to say next.
We're, we're good. We're good. Our rules for radicals is what's driving this. In other words, it provides a background. I couldn't say it's driving it, but it provides a background of understanding of where they're coming from. Written by Saul and Lipsky back in the 1970s, early 1970s, and several key points. First of all, he dedicated it to Lucifer. Now, Lucifer, according to his definition, is the rebellious one. And, of course, they're very rebellious. Uh, another name would be Satan, of course, the father of all lies. In this book, uh, he says, we are connected, are concerned with how to create mass organizations to seize power and give it to the people. Literally, that's what they're trying to do. They are trying to destroy the United States of America as we have historically known it. Now, they have the utopian vision of what they want to create. Of course, you and I know that they'll, they'll never happen. It cannot happen. But nonetheless, this is what they are trying to do. He goes on to say in the next slide, or next um, Marxist begins with his prime truth that all evils are caused by the exploitation of the proletariat by the capitalists. From this, he logically proceeds to revolution to end capitalism. So they are definitely trying to end capitalism which has created the wealth that we all enjoy. And then into the third stage of reorganization into a new social order and the dictatorship of the proletariat. And finally, the last stage, the political paradise of communism. So their ultimate goal is Marxism or communism. And we you have to understand that it's a very weak Achilles heel. And that's where Agenda 21 and all of these things are coming from because that is the end result of this is in the form of communism, total rule. The third rule of the ethics of means and ends is in the war, the ends justify almost any means. And this is very important to understand. You cannot take anything they say at face value. They will lie, they will cheat, they will distort, they will try to do anything they can to advance their agenda. Understand that right from the start. Do not accept what they say. Don't channel, challenge the individuals, challenge the ideology. And then finally, what is happening here is that we have created, through this process, both Republican and Democratic progressives, almost a $16 trillion debt. We go to the U.S. debt clock in the next one. Basically, a $16 trillion debt that it costs us $138,000 per individual. There is no way we can pay that off. None. Through, and that's equal through an inflation. That's how they've done it in the past. The deficit for this year alone is $1.4 trillion. President Obama has actually accumulated $5 trillion worth of debt already, over $5 trillion of debt already. That is more than all the presidents combined up until Bush, George W. Bush, in 2000. Incredible how they have knocked up this debt that we have now around our necks. But that's not the worst of it, folks. If you look at our new, nor our next, go to the next slide, the total national assets of 83 or 84 trillion dollars, we have 119 trillion dollars worth of unfunded liabilities. There's only 65 trillion, the gross domestic product of the world is only 65 trillion dollars, and yet we have basically 120 trillion dollar unfunded liability that is going to dog and put a rope around our neck and sink us to the bottom of the ocean if we do not change it very, very quickly. It's got to be done. And I'm not saying that uh, we should just necessarily abolish Social Security and so forth, but we have to put it on a more financial footing. That means one $1 million per taxpayer. Again, there is no way we can pay that off. If we were actually our deficit spending on an individual uh, working class person, the average salary in the United States is $49,000 a year. The actual tax to pay for all this would be forty two, almost $43,000 a year. Unbelievable. And yet, we're just accumulating this, and it's a rock around our neck that we'll never get out of unless we start taking some action right now. Now, what about this? And this is a very, I think, very interesting thing that you can perhaps use. Paul Cooper, why can't these progressive liberals understand the concept of debt? Because their ideology blinds them. They cannot see the consequences of debt. 
Krugman said this in January. When people in D.C. talk about deficits and debt, and by and large, they have no idea what they're talking about. Well, as Krugman doesn't have any idea. But nonetheless, he goes on to say, and the people who talk the most understand the least. In other words, we're a bunch of ignoramuses. Families have to pay back their debt. Governments don't. All they need to do is ensure that debt grows more slowly than their tax base. Well, this is a major, major chink in their armor. Right there, because what he is looking at at this is a very simplistic answer. And this is what you will find with all of your progressives, is that they have linear thinking and it's not deep. They have no understanding of, of uh, critical thinking whatsoever. Because this is not taking into account what China is going to do. China is attacking the dollar as the, as, the, as the world reserve currency right now. You haven't heard about that, but they are. If we lose the world reserve currency, we're dead in the water because tens of trillions of dollars is going to come back on our house in the United States and we can, there's no way we can pay that off. It's going to be hyperinflation. Finally, Crookman says this, we need more, not less government, spending to get us out of the unemployment trap than the wrong-headed, ill-informed obsession with the debt is standing in the way. Understand that they honestly believe that they can just continue to plow into more and more and more debt because it's the best thing to get us out of the recession that we're in. And of course, you and I know that it's not true. Every case where we've gotten out of a recession or depression in the past has been done by cutting back the size of government. Now, this is the last couple of slides here. I'm going to the next slide with the disconnect from reality. Uh, Dr. Lyle Rossiter said this. He had 40 years of experience as a psychiatrist with many studies. He said that the degree of modern liberalism and irrationality far exceeds any misunderstanding that could be attributed to the faulty fact gathering or logical error. Under careful scrutiny, progressive liberalism's distortions of the normal ability to reason can only be understood as a product of psychopathology. Modern liberal minds with distorted perceptions and a destructive agenda are the product of disturbed personalities. Understand, these people are sick. They're to be pity, and yet they control every major institution in this country. He goes on to say that progressive liberals deny their own propensity for hatred and violence. In other words, they are extremely violent. For all the accusations they make against us, they are a hundred times worse. The liberal mind is an angry mind determined to force people into a stereotype categories, but unable to acknowledge that their own political coercion, coercion is a form of criminal violence. And then finally, I'm not going to go into these individually, I don't have time, but in the book, if you get the book, and we'll send it to you free, and lay out these eight points that you can, or nine points, eight points, that you can usually ask a candidate about and determine whether or not they are a progressive or a American that wants to uphold the Constitution. So that's a solution that we can start to apply here as time goes on. And if you go to the last slide where I go to the book again um, and get the book, well, by going to epinc at roadrunner.com and we'll, get, we'll send you a free book. You know what I'm asking you to do? Is if you agree with what's in the book and think it is an important instrument, is to tell other groups and people and so forth about this book so that it can become a major factor in the election. We need to get this out so it can be discussed uh, in the press. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman, so much. And uh, can you stick around through the whole call? Because I think we have some people with questions after the other presenters. Yes, I'm sure you do.